yo men and hopefully future patriarchs out there on today's episode of CMask with Mike, Will, and Nick. We're going to be talking about whether or not it's actually possible, advisable, hopeful for spouses to be friends. And of course, under the auspices of Christian marriage, that would be best friends because your spouse is the only one that you can be one flesh with. So, I mean, basically the problematic is this. The red pill and guys like that, skeptics of feminism, fellow travelers of, of ours in some limited sense, are highly also skeptical that husbands and wives can be best friends. So I want to explore the topic fully today. First, I just want to say what's up to Mike, Will, and Nick. How are you boys doing? How was your Halloween? It was good. It was great. We, we kept all the lights off so nobody came to our door. It was glorious. <laughs> I let the dog out the, uh, the the dog was out of the cage and popping up at the window for all the trick or treaters as they came around. But we left a few sweets outside, but didn't get big into it. Never do. Did you, did you give uh, the dog a good Halloween and feed a few children to it? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, a few got scared through the window though, so she joined in the festivities. Understandable. Good. It's a terrifying <laughs> Good. <laughs> Nick was over at my place along with others. We 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 like Halloween a lot. We do it up. So um anyway, happy All Saints Day to everyone. Happy All Souls Day. Um Saturday, depending on what day this video gets hung. Um it's the autumn hollow tide, and it's it's a really important reminder of uh our debt memento mori. I, I love the fact that we have an autumn triduum. Sea mask viewers, happy autumn triduum to all of you. Now, the this this topic is important because we have a common foe. By we, I mean masculinist folks, along with um, who who are Christian, along with red pill and some of the young. I guess you you'd call it men going their own way crew, along with some of the young groipers who tend to be kind of, I don't know what you'd call them, incel-like. And we all make fun of a lot of the same stuff. You know, the the centrality of feminism in society, gynocentrism, whatever you want to call it. Well, pretty much all of those other parties regularly recur to um, mockery in regard to the concept of spousal best friendship. I heard um, some red pillar influencer doing it just last week. I've, I've heard um, Nick J. Fuentes make fun of it. I've heard all, all, all of these parties do it at some point or another. So I wanted to make a show based on distinction. Like we're not, we're not the feminists. I mean, we're the real opponents of the feminists. And yet there in book eight and book nine of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. He, uh, I'm getting a feedback suddenly. Um, he says, you know, men, he, he writes lines that imply that men and women, broadly speaking, can't be friends, but under a special class of, of true friendship, Aristotle says men and women, if they are spouses, can be friends, and it's called a friendship of unequals. Um, the basic layout in Aristotle's methodology in the Nicomachean Ethics for Friends is there's two fake forms of friendship, friendships of utility, the lowest form, friendship of pleasure, um, the second lowest form. Both of these are accidental forms of friendship for Aristotle when something's called an accidental version of itself. It's, it's, it's materially maybe a friendship or a thing, whatever the thing is, but it's not essentially actually the the true version then he goes through true friendships true friendships are based on virtue mutual admiration in each of the other for their moral excellence he even talks um in early book eight about what do you do if you're friends with someone and you become morally excellent and they stay where they're at morally mediocre have a little patience but eventually like attracts like you'll you'll have to break up the friendship if they don't come with you talks about another situation what if you are 
both morally mediocre and your friend drops into actual vice, he says, break that friendship off immediately because, again, like attracts like. Um, at the end of book eight, the beginning of book nine, he talks about friendship between unequals. And this can be the highest form of friendship, a king and his subject, uh, a father and his son, the young and the old generally, and husband and wife. These are all friendships between a higher party who has who outranks the other party and a lower party. The difference between true friendships, that is to say type three friendships of uh, equals, when we're talking about true friendships of unequals, is that they get uneven, asymmetric benefits from the friendship in, in the latter type. In the former type, they get the same benefit from the friendship. So, so your best friend who is your peer growing up, you got equal measures of the same thing out of the friendship. But what I want to offer here today to, to break all this into small uh, bite-sized pieces for people that haven't read Aristotle is that the Christianized version of Aristotle, which is really what we're after, um, Catholic teaching, is um, it reduces to a really simple proposition not only are friendships between this one man and this one woman eminently possible and plausible, but friendship between them will be the best form of friendship because Christ raised the sacrament, uh, the, the, the institution of marriage to a sacrament. So having said that, um, not only does Aristotle, the great philosopher of nature say it, but our our Catholic uh, tradition, the teachers, the fathers, and of course, Thomas, the, the leader of all scholastics, says it's um, the highest form of friendship, you know, kind of the philosophers of supernature. And I want to vindicate that, but I do want to talk about, um, you know, maybe maybe spend some time distingu distinguishing why red pill guys and, and others find it so suspicious. And they're like, isn't this just another Trojan horse? For feminism, so so maybe we could talk about some of the potential pitfalls of misapprehending the idea of that before we talk about um, uh, what the strong attributes of it are. Uh, what do you what do you say to that, Nick? Uh, the main way that I it would make sense for the red pill to criticize the idea of men and women being friends is be is because I think most men do it. Uh, by treating the woman like just another dude that they're friends with and then like everyone gets confused why like that didn't work because it like that wouldn't work obviously um right so i think you know, gender if, dysphoria yeah yeah and so like the red pill guys just aren't smart enough to to realize well the reason why that kind of friendship doesn't work is because you're supposed to treat her like a woman because she's a woman so I guess I think that I mean, that'd be the most logical reason why they might do that. I guess I'll give, that I'll give an or... analogy for how what you just said is is powerful. Uh, so uh, kind of wasp waspy boomerism, um, at least here in America, to say um, I, I'm your I'm your father. I'm not your friend. Um, and we've talked about this on the show before. This just means that. I'm taken literally. This means I'm your father. I'm not a lover of your soul. A friend is just a lover of your soul. So this is an incredibly stupid thing that waspy boomer should stop saying. Um, but the pitfall here is the same as the one that you just enumerated, Nick. There are two. I mean, there, there's only one true form of friendship. There are two accidental forms. It's where you will the good of the other. And, and this means you raise each other's level of virtue by association. But there's friendship between equals and friendships between unequals. Just as you said of men and women, these wasp boomers who don't understand that, that the old are called to befriend the young, they just, they're, they're misapprehending that they're called to be friendships of unequals uh, somewhat. And probably old and the young is the least naturally just unequal. But king and his subject, husband and his wife... A uh, father and his son, a specific old and young, specific higher and lower, yeah, is it, called to really be asymmetric in the benefits conferred by the friendship. So I, I think that's that's a really um, that's a really strong point. W what what else do you think, Mike? 
the red pill is misunderstanding when they hear us say, you know, I'm, I'm best friends with my wife um, versus the way that normie feminist, like slack jawed guys out in the burbs say it. Well, I think the red pill uh, views relationships purely through the lens of biology and, you know, what is innate to the human male and the human female. So I can't say they're all the way incorrect in their diagnosis much with other things that they get right. Because if there's, if you remove the, the spiritual, if you remove the soul, if you remove God from the equation and you get just pure biological tendency and behaviors, I could see how there would be some fear and trepidation in, in treating your wife like your best friend, because where, where do you get grace, grace from? Where do you get love from? And so this is something that I struggled with in previous relationships when I was this red pill guy was that I have to put on this, 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 this front, I've got to put on this armor perpetually because if without grace, what do we really have? And so when you remove the soul component of a, of a marriage, it's not really a marriage. It's just a civil relationship. I can see how there'd be a man. If she sees through the the cracks in my armor, so to speak, if I show any kind of humility, I don't like using the word vulnerability, but if I expose myself a little bit and show a bit of my weakness, then she's going to run for the hills. And a lot of times they do because men left to their own devices, we want to sow our wild oats, so to speak, and women left to their own devices. I mean, are hypergamous. I'm not going to disagree with their di diagnostics there. And so I think they get this fundamentally wrong because the basis of the relationship is fundamentally wrong. There's no actually real authority structure in a red pill, even in an exclusive relationship, um, because there's no head to you. And by virtue of that, there can be no head of the household for her. That's the first thing that comes to mind for me. Is I don't want to get totally on a sidetrack, but isn't hypergamy just the... Um name that one of the midwit leaders of red pill maybe one of the three godfathers or whatever made up for rational self-interest and isn't it isn't it sort of um common to both sexes on the dating market that you want to you want to get as high as high a product as you can get on the sexual marketplace I, I, I've never seen how it's unique to women. Every time I, I had, um... yeah, no, no, right, and, that, and that's that's a good point. I just think the way that it's expressed, the way that it's, I guess, shown, is different. Would women date higher, you know, in terms of status? So in some ways, uh, looks as well. It's, I guess, they kind of come at come at it from like an evo psych perspective, a survival perspective. They're always looking for the stronger, more um, higher status, wealthier, etc. Male, and then on the on the male side, it's who's the hotter, more attractive version of the last woman that, you know, he just left her for type of thing. Um, so they're not exactly the same across, but yeah, I guess you could apply the same thing to both. I'm not sure if Rolo popularized that with, with uh, the rational male, um, but certainly, yeah, the male hypergamy isn't spoken about enough. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, all it is is rational self-interest, but even then yep. these guys are not going to get over Aristotle, the master of those who know. Men and women are unequal in rank. That means the sort of friend and, and Aristotle's skeptical about men being able to be friends with women. And, and so am I, I think all of us are um, broadly speaking, but one man can be friend one woman and this will be his best friend in, uh, in the Christian tradition. If a sacrament is what, what we really say it is and it is, but um, what Aristotle says about friendships of unequals, rings true that men are hypergamous with the proper object of being like hotness and women are hypergamous with the the proper object of provision and protection right so once again the benefits conferred by friendships of unequal are are different whereas your, your best friend growing up your best friend in high school your best friend in college you know your best friend out of college before you're married was a, a guy who gave and got, contributed and took from the friendship basically the same things you did. He admired your um, moral excellences, or maybe when you're younger, they were more like physical excellences. They're all called arites or virtues in Aristotle. Um, 
in basically the same measure and the same kind that you did. That's a friendship between equals. Everyone thinks a friendship between equals, who, everyone who hasn't studied Aristotle, is basically the only kind of friendship at issue. So even the one or two key premises missing philosophy of nature. So when you go to the ultimate philosopher of nature, Aristotle, he just sees way beyond. And it's one simple distinction away from, from, you know, what the red pill thinks is so cutting edge, uh, but isn't. Well, what, what do you say about this? Well, I was thinking when Mike was talking about removing God and the soul from the equation, you're going to remove male friendship then as well. Doesn't make any sense. And without the soul, you've got no intellect, you've got no free will. The preconditions for friendship just disappear because it's the willing of the objective good of the friend. And if there's no soul to have an objective good and no will to do that, then good luck. And in fact, even with the materialist paradigm of the red pill, all you're left with is just dominance between men. Right. The, the idea of friendship between men is kind of incoherent. Yeah. It's just a group of guys who have a pecking order and they do things side by side. Like they have a common goal, but there's no real um, face to face friendship. It's just we're going to hunt the mammoth or we're going to kill this group of other guys. It's very much a side by side adventure. Whereas what Christianity says, and this is the controversial thing, I think, is that. When God sees that it's not good for man to be alone and he needs a, a helpmate, sure, he needs a, a female to be able to procreate with. And St. Augustine says that's the main way in which woman is the helper. But he also has a companion, right? a need for companionship too. And the woman provides him with a deeper level of companionship than any man can. That's the really controversial thing, I think, that irks the red pill because they're stuck within the bath of the sexes paradigm like a, a woman and a man can be complementary and she can give him that deep level of companionship no it doesn't make sense to them they think that women are the enemy or that they're like just kind of crappy men that like well i'd rather hang out with my bros because like i relate to them better you know we can have deeper conversations we can smoke cigars and like make jokes and talk politics but like oh i gotta go hang out with this woman like it's not as fun it's not as interesting and i go back to that um sam hyde joke that he said like if like guys are super confused if that's what they're looking for in a woman which is sort of like the first point that i said like yeah if you treat her like a dude or you expect her to be a dude you will be perpetually disappointed right and it's why a lot of the pagan anti-feminist right wing are homosexual as well because mm -hmm. they actually crave that companionship that they can't really get from another woman because they don't understand what women are and they just keep going for it and pushing further and further with men until you end up trying to fall in love with another dude <laughs> yeah this this phenomenon nick is an i think an externalized insecurity where in they the, the the red the red pill prescribes the men ought to hang out with other dudes so whatever virtues you're bringing to the equation you just you need to be around you know eight other guys like that or five other guys the wolf pack um where where in christian patriarchy i mean dig this it admonishes that we become as ec morally excellent as we can across all of the Aristotelian categories, the moral, the moral excellences of, of books um, three, four, and five in the Nicomachean Ethics. Get those on your own or get them in your group of friends before you get married. Once you have them, what you can't actually acquire are female-specific excellences, stuff like um, daily cooking, cleaning, um, care, comfort, consolation. I, the, the, I guess it all begins with C, or at least the heart C sound. That you can't get no matter how hard you try. And that, from this, emanates the Christian concept of complementarity that only comes from the sacrament. That um, no matter how hard you try, no matter how excellent a man you are, a man still basically needs a woman around to fill in the spots that he, he will not have. Whereas the red pill and and men going their own way, 
they will constantly say, hang out with men, men, men. Um, it is not the, all that latently homosexualist. And they're simply denying Again, I don't. I don't want to beat too much on the or beat too much up on the red pill. Um, the, the common goal is feminist, but this is really important. They're denying nature. Nature is that we need in our homes, and we feel this most sharply as bachelors. Complementarity, and that's why we're all looking for one good woman, so to make it. You know, your, your house isn't a home until it's been really um, cheered up, pepped up, decorated by a woman. You go visit a bachelor's place and you're like, this is not a home. And I've, I've never gone to a bachelor's place and thought it's a home. But consolation, comfort, care, compassion, this stuff, are, these are the female-specific excellences. And it makes sense when we say that's complementarity. One man is made for one woman. They're going to go become one flesh. This is the highest form of friendship. Just don't say they're equals. I, I find the <clears throat> Genesis 3, 2 to be very deep. Um, so God's making, in, in the order of creation, he's making the sun and the moon and the stars and the animals and the plants. And every time he makes something, he says, this is good. And of course it's good. It couldn't have been otherwise because he's goodness itself. And so when he makes something, it will be good. And then he makes man and he sees man as good, but that there's an incompleteness there. And the incompleteness is that he's alone. And we can then know all of the ways in which his aloneness is problematic by how God solves the problem. And the way God solves the problem is not with like 50 or 100 men to listen to what he has to say and like carry out his orders. It's also not like four or five guys who will debate and commune with him or like protect Eden. It's a woman. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of going back to Will's point, like that's what they can't comprehend and there is something deeply, deeply unnatural with both the feminists and the red pills to think that, or I guess to deny in yourself that. And and I think that's why almost there's, maybe this is from feminism, maybe it's sort of an organic playground thing, I don't know. But um, I mean, from day one, you're sort of taught that like, ew, you know, boys and girls don't really like each other. And then the only way that they're allowed to like each other in adulthood is through like fornication, but, but not through like genuine desire for the presence of the other person in your life. Well, it's just sexual utility for the red pill guys, right? <clears throat> they can't relate to anything beyond the utilitarian purpose of that relationship. Yeah. And they and kind so of feel like these... they're getting closer by, because Tate was just talking about kids recently on Twitter, like he'll pretend like he's getting even closer to like, like he's somehow discovering virtue. And he's like, well, actually the only legacy that matters isn't Bugatti's it's kids. So like, go, go have kids with your woman. It's like, you're still not just able to say that like having a wife, Andrew is good for you and you should love her and she'll make you better. And you'll be happy because she's a woman. Like you have to, kick it off to some kind of like Genghis Khan dynastic. Well, I'm going to have like 15 kids because I want my legacy to live on. Like, you're just afraid of women. <laughs> well, that this is the point that we were touching on <clears throat> when we talked about masculinity and femininity, both being perfections and how women aren't defective men. Because Tim, I can't remember the exact bit, correct me if I'm wrong, but the so Aquinas talks about how um, women are necessary for the for the perfection of human nature, right? The the completion and perfection of it. So you can't do without them. And the red pill seems to regard femininity as a kind of irritation in many ways. Like they get confused between the fact that there's there's hierarchy and there's inequality, and we do recognize that men are superior to women, just overall. That's the real frontline battle against feminism. You have to be willing to say that, not just different, but men are superior. Yeah. But we still acknowledge that femininity is a perfection and it completes human nature. 
it's not an inconvenience. Women aren't an inconvenience. Yeah. And <clears throat> see, it was really that, that clarifying thought, Will, that there, there's a lot of things I want to say based on what your last comment stands for. But when you spearheaded that show by saying, look, we have to stop just saying different from this is, this is putty, pussyfooting around the issue. We have to say superior to in rank. And which is something I've said a long time too. That helps us to do properly the highest form of friendship between unequals, which is that between a husband and his wife, higher than that between a, a king and a subject, higher than even that between a father and a son, higher than that between, you know, some virtuous old person and some virtuous young person, who, which are other very, very viable, other very, very valuable forms of truly loving the, the soul of the person and wishing the good for the other. The way to avoid the pitfall is to reemphasize this to yourself every day. This is my best friend, my wife, husbands out there say that. The pitfall always remains though, the, the main one. And you know, since we've jumped into the two on two marriage coaching, I'm seeing it pop up more and more. I think it popped up in the discussion questions in our one flesh class. Um, it, it answered when it was so it was a, a question on the lips of a wife, a, a, like a pretty good wife, a pretty non feminist wife who asked us, um, OK, look, I, I get that that my that I have to submit to my husband. You know, it's clear it's there in the Bible. I'm not going to try the mutual submission uh, canard. That doesn't work. That's a contradiction in terms. I'm not going to deny that the Bible exists the way the secular feminist did. OK, so I have to submit. But. If I don't submit, you know, that's not that's not such a big deal, right? Because I was I was teaching this is clearly a mortal sin. This is a violation of the fourth commandment. And the Bible was really, really clear about it. Magisterium is really clear about it. It's a grave evil. So, in other words, all this while, last five years or so, I've been saying this stuff publicly. And reasonably Christian, reasonably trad Catholic women will push back hard, as everyone here knows. I've always thought they know enough to know that what they're doing is going to get them in big, 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 big trouble. It's a soteriological trouble, salvific trouble. How are they allowing their cognitive dissonance to jeopardize their soul so much? You know, by just saying, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to obey my husband. I'm not going to submit. The answer is they say, I, it, I got it in this form a couple of weeks ago. They say, well, no, I, I do need to submit, but it's not a moral sin. No, it, we, I guess we have to articulate this clearly too, that in the Christian tradition, it is a mortal sin for any wife to disobey a hard order given by any husband to her specifically, same as a kid. And it does not have to be grave matter specific, right? It doesn't have to be some explicit articulation of the implicit natural law or something. It doesn't have to be a husband saying thou shalt not kill uh, or murder someone else to his wife. And if she violates that, she committed a mortal sin. No, it can be something that is trifling and is prudential. Like um, same as a father saying to his kid, don't eat outside of the kitchen in my home. If the kid disobeys, that's a mortal sin, even though it's not a violation of the natural law without more, without the husband, without the father articulating it. It's the same exact thing with wives. And I'm bringing that up in today's show because it's the easiest pitfall for both men and women from both a kind of objective and subjective perspective to think, well, for best friends, uh, Nick, you were talking about this last night. Men start even feeling like, well, I don't, I don't issue orders to my best friends and, and wives kind of on the um, expectation management level say the same thing. If you're really my best friend, you wouldn't be ordering me around. That's how best friendships between equals are. When you're growing up, your 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 buddy, your bosom chum, who's your peer? Yeah, you don't order him around. That's why everyone needs to get it straight in their head that this is a different kind of true friendship. This is a friendship between unequals. It shares many of the qualities, like like companionship joking, lightheartedness when it's appropriate, fun as friendships between equals. But in times where an order is needed, it will always be issued by the man. 
and must always be observed by the woman. Hey, this is what we're doing. I think that's the easiest pitfall. What, what do you What do you guys say, Nick? What do you say? You were kind of addressing this last night. I, as you were talking, tried to picture what, um, you know, my perception of uh, kingdoms and uh, both from the Old Testament and also like the Arthurian tales, that if a king had sent down a proclamation, something even as banal as like you're not allowed to wear a certain color of garment because it upsets him. It was enforced like under pain of death. And the denizens of the kingdom just understood the king said this. And so we we will behave accordingly because this is the law of the land. <clears throat> and there was sort of a, a, an, a reverence for the office of king that was unquestioned. It was almost hardwired. It was almost genetic, like culturally. And earlier in the sea mask, I was reflecting on sort of the Jane Austen era perception of men where the women were so determined to get a good man. They were really concerned. Like, am I, am I going to be married to a good man? Um, the man was the prize, not to use this kind of annoying red pill language, but the man genuinely was the prize. Mm -hmm. And if you, if what we're saying is true, that men are higher than women in rank and in creation, then on the bell curve, like the, the, the median man, the, the middle 80% of men are more prize worthy than the middle 80% of women in terms of rank, in terms of creation, in terms of value. And then somewhere along the way, probably, you know, Seneca Falls or, or whatever precipitated Seneca Falls, there was this shift where the woman is the prize and men have to um, achieve or become something in order to acquire a woman and be worthy of a woman. And that perception of the man as holding this kingly office in creation i think evaporated and i think it's only in the absence of that can a traditional catholic woman today be so calm in thinking that disobeying her husband isn't a grave mortal sin no matter what he's commanding or proposing or preferring that he is not Adam to her. He is not the thing that was created first. Um, he's just like a dude. And oh, okay, I guess God says like, I should do this, but it's not a big deal. We're living in the fallout, I think of like the princess generation, where there's multi generations of women that have raised been raised to believe that their, their shit doesn't stink and their farts don't smell. And so what I mean by that is, is that they're beyond correction. I mean, what happens to our children if we don't correct them? They just run amok, and they think they're the authority figure, and it's just uncontrolled chaos. And we're living in, in a time where men, they don't really know the position or fully acknowledge the position they hold in their homes, and they're afraid of their wives, and they're afraid of correcting their wives. This is part of the reason why we're the head of the home. Like, we're not just the the priest and prophet. We're the, the teacher, and sometimes the, the teacher has got to lay the law down. And I'm seeing this more and more and more and more. I mean, Tim, you said it so well. So the first rule of feminism is you can't hurt women's feelings. I went on FRAD, and I think I did a very gentle definition of patriarchy and explained it. And women are coping and seething. And Matt also posted a video of us talking about how I encourage my wife to stay in shape. And if a, a, a woman is out of shape or overweight, then it's a sign of the man's failed leadership. And the comments are filled with rage. It's hurt feelings, guys. That's all that matters. And I think there's got to be a hard correction in the opposite direction. It's going to be uncomfortable, but we're living in the fallout of this princess generation. And then also guys that don't know that they've abdicated their roles and no longer know how to correct their wives. And so when that happens, there's, it's uncontrolled chaos. Femininity does best within the container of patriarchy and masculinity. That's truly when it's the most free. They think that they're free now when they're really enslaved and rebellious. And they, their need of 
in need of heavy handed correction. And I said that on Frat's show and a bunch of women in the comments were like, what did he mean by heavy handed? It's like, like, I'm literally going to slap my wife. You're retarded. If that's what I mean, if I have to explain everything and over nuance everything, there's no power in what we're talking about anymore. I mean, because you, you can tell I'm a little bit frustrated. I think we just need to we need to just burn it down. It's correction. We need more correction. But I'm at a tangent now, so. <laughs> but it's it's also a natural pitfall. That, that That's just what I want to, because the guys that are listening to this are the ones that are trying to sort of crawl out of the hole. It's a natural pitfall for even someone like me that's been doing marriage for 20 years. Um, because this is, I mean, the man is the prize for the woman. I agree. But the woman is the prize for the man. I don't, I, I've never believed in, um, I didn't get a dowry. I don't know if you guys did on your wedding day. I somehow doubt it. But the real prize is getting a, the virtuous woman. That's all I wanted when I was a young man. And I, I got one. Um, I got, you know, the most, the most virtuous woman that I, I ever knew that I've ever known. And yeah. And, and that's how she feels about me. That doesn't mean we're equal in rank. And, and, and that's, that's the nature of sort of, those are, these are the grounding presuppositions of the show we're doing, but it, here's what I'm saying. It is even to not, not the kind of person who says like, what do you mean heavy handed? I mean, even, even to me, I'm the one articulating a lot of this stuff. It's easy to start becoming because it is a highly nuanced delicate, frangible, uh, most special human relationship because it's the highest human relationship after Christ elevated marriage to the dignity of a sacrament. Um, it is the absolute highest and it's the absolute hardest to do really, really well. So psychologically, it's easy for even the people that know better to start treating this highest friendship of unequals as uh, one of the highest friendships between equals, peer friendship. And you just start naturally doing it because there is peership. There is a kind of peer review process that goes into stuff when you're raising your kids and they do something funny, you and your wife kind of laugh. Like like peers would laugh, you know, and you, you, you're you watching them at the park and one kid does something funny or talks too much or, or you know, falls around the room to get attention or whatever. And you and your wife look at each other knowingly and laugh. There is a, a peership between you, but but there also is not at all time. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. So it's just really hard to do well, to always remember that even though there are elements of peer friendship here, I am always the one that has to make decisions and I can't start pawning them off, farming them out on my wife. And and so that's that's why I really wanted to, to lean into this show. What are the benefits and... Now, what are the benefits? What are the burdens of the fact that marriage is this beautiful institution, the highest form of friendship? The only, if anyone doubts that it's the highest form of friendship between unequals, what about a father and his son? They never become one flesh, you know, in, in, in healthy situations. And only one is meant to, and only one flesh properly conceived brings forth life. And I mean, the most fundamentally magical force in nature is procreation and it stems uh, among rational animals from this special kind of friendship so because all this is so special the dangers heighten that's all i'm saying it, does this make sense with people yeah and the one flesh point was great there tim because it's also about charity isn't it and by loving god our soul is united to him so you can think of love as willing the objective good of the other or you can think of it as a kind of uniting principle and it's yep. about deepening the one flesh union between husband and wife so for people who are confused thinking about friendship you can also think about it in terms of charity and how we are supposed to become um, friends with christ friends with god so there's that level of it as well um the other question i was thinking of here is that even between two men who are friends, you still get correction. Like if your friend's doing something yeah. dumb and he's really your friend, you correct him. You don't say, oh, he's my friend, so I better not say anything that might upset him. 
No, if yeah. you're a true friend, you will do that. And I think that's quite rare, like among guy friends, to actually have the hard conversations. They're vague about that duty of friendship as well. And it gets even worse in marriage when the stakes are higher. They don't actually know how to correct. So, and there's a there's an element of having to be more gentle with your wife than you are with your friend. I know we use powerful language here too, but you know my wife is a part of me. I'm part of her. We're this united, you we're this we're this union under God. So when I say heavy handed correction and all this stuff, I mean I mean correction, but I don't mean I'm belittling her. I might as well just go and belittle myself and flagellate myself in front of the mirror. I'm I'm. To care for somebody's soul means to share objectively hard truths and to correct them when they're off base. But that doesn't mean that I'm, you're harsh. We're not proposing that we're harsh with our wives. But in a friendship between men, there's certainly a place for that. And there's a need for that. I think there's more of a need for that now more than ever. Um, and that's how even more elevated above that kind of friendship that marriage is. Because there is, Tim, you made it such a good point. It is really hard to walk that line. And that's why, you know, when we say, well, submit to God first, I'm truly probably because I'm a scrupulous guy too. I care more about being on the right side of the equation with God. And that tempers my speech and that tempers my behavior with my wife in my correction of her. You know, most of the time, obviously, you know, we all fail. But again, not to get into symptomology, I'm not a tyrant. She's not a feminist when she's doing something, let's say that's quote unquote disobedient or whatever. That's the song and dance of marriage and that's why it's so important this is what the red pill guy's going to get wrong is i'm looking up in order to look down and guide well i'm not looking to myself really big distinction there i yeah. have a, a chemistry question um so not not like chemistry like relationship chemistry question so the Isabel and i've been watching some older movies we just watched life with father which came out in 47 i think but it takes place in 1883 in new york and there's a, a very performative like patriarchal representation in older movies um and there's very little friendship between husband and wife in these sorts of representations um i also think about it in terms of the um even the sort of jane austen victorian representations of husband and wife there's not a whole lot of friendship there or familiarity on the other extreme i do think that this is a problem we've articulated already in this show is that guys are treating their wives as men and as equals and ceding the patriarchal ground um so my question is how do men strike a balance of not being so comfortable that she doesn't see you as the head of the household, but not being like this weird LARPy 1800 suit jacket monocle wearing, like I'm the head of this establishment type thing as well. Um, Cause Tim, you, you were setting up like these little uh, vignettes of the kid does something that makes you both laugh and I can totally see how at a certain point, even with even with having sort of like long philosophical conversations or something with your spouse, that it could get to a point where you she stops seeing you as the head of the household and you stop seeing her as like your wife and you guys just start seeing each other as like bros. Yeah. Like a lot I mean, of guys it, really screw up. Go ahead, Tim. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no sorry. You just, just, the, that friendship is um, oriented, uh, ordered toward the the cultivation of a highly specialized oikonomia, like an, an, a norms of a household. And it the specialized labor is really important, even among trads when they lean too much into being friends with your wife as friends of equals. They'll start getting mad when you point out the specialization of, of labor demanded by the oikonomia, the, the, the nomos of the household, the law of the household. And they'll get mad if you don't say, they won't get mad if you say a man shouldn't wear a dress. But if you say a man shouldn't change a diaper in, in a, on a typical day, 
they get offended because they're violating that themselves. And you know, all you're saying is there is such a thing as oikonomia, that that um, you can be friends, you can laugh, you can joke, you can flirt, you should do this, you should have fun. You should be peers some throughout the day, peer-like some throughout the day. Unlike, I mean, you even have this with moments like this with your older kids, but you shouldn't forget that you're not peers. And this is always instantiated, crystallized, hardened, purified when the household runs as it's supposed to run. Sorry, Mike, go ahead. That's interesting. No, that's great. I think a couple of different things. One, a lot of guys, they look at this as obviously as a relationship of equals. So they end up overburdening. They're already burdened wives with their emotional baggage. It's not to say my wife doesn't know what I'm struggling with or what's going on with me, but I don't place that burden on her shoulders. I don't make her carry it. What I'm trying to do as a man is unburden her so she can do her job to the best of her ability. And so when you treat her like your therapist or your emotional tampon, of course, she's not going to see you as the head of the household. You should have guy friends for that, right? And on the other hand, it's uh, treat your wife like a, a, a woman, make her laugh, like dote on her, you know, uh, flirt with her. I think we, because we, we, we live with them, of course, there, there's this, this tendency to gravitate toward comfort and to look at this person purely as just your friend. But don't forget that there's a, there's a, a dynamic of polarity always playing out. And it can work in your favor or it can work against you. And so a lot of the guys that myself or, with, or what Will does with his marriage coaching, we, we see this problem where they stop doing any of these things and then they just overburden them with the, the, the emotional stuff. And so how can that woman look properly to your leadership? If you're putting stuff on her shoulders instead of taking away, what I'm trying to do, obviously, most of the time when I'm aware of it, which hopefully is most of the time, is unburden my wife so she can perform to, her, to the best of her ability with our children and in the home make her laugh, flirt with her, dote on her, you know, continue to sort of um, uh, foster that spark between us that's good for the both of us and then not overburdening her. And it can get pretty and bad. And so you guys screw that up. Yeah. yeah. If you if you just, someone said, oh, my, my marriage isn't going well and you say, well, you're supposed to be best friends with your wife, so why don't you just work on your friendship? And then they're like, what? What does that mean? How do I do that? Well, why don't you focus on doing some things you enjoy together? And like Mike says, make her laugh and have fun. I, I don't know how to do that. And they'll like open up Google, like how to make a woman laugh or like how to have fun or how to make a friend. It's on that level. Like how they might not have any friends at all. How, how do I be friends with someone? And that's the real thing that's going wrong at the core of it. It's just basic connection. I wonder also to what Mike just said, then if there's, um, if the way that you, a way that a man removes all polarity in his marriage is through, um, effeminacy, which is to say it's more comfortable to relax into a, a perceived friendship of equals because it requires nothing of you. Uh, to treat your wife like a bro versus perhaps some some discipline to maintain the frame of I'm I'm the man she is the woman I'm going to flirt with her like you know maybe we're still dating I'm going to make her laugh like I'm still trying to garner her interest I'm going to correct her in small ways so she's always growing in virtue like I'm going to make sure that the the chores are being done and she's taking care of the kids in the in the proper way like all of that probably requires a level of attendance that maybe if a guy's effeminate if a guy's lazy that maybe that's what relaxes the marriage into this this uh just bro sesh yeah yeah, yeah, guys don't know how to continue to carry that burden. They know how to do it for the first little bit of courtship or whatever. They get her and then they relax into this like slothful state. When I'm aware every morning that I wake up, I'm like, okay, I'm renewing this promise. I'm renewing this vow. I've got to show up to the best of my ability and do these things every single day. That's why it's the hardest thing to do is to have a virtuous, loving, um, you know, um, union that where you have a lot of sex and share a lot of, beautiful memories guys often forget about that it's an active role it's an active duty just yeah. like m many men know this as fathers 
but completely neglect that on the side of their marriage, which is a complete failure. Yeah, and that's again where the departure from the home Perfect. to go work a <laughs> job for a long period of time that you don't like is not there's nothing to do with being a patriarch. Okay, not nothing. It has it has little to do with what Mike, you and I were just sort of outlining as um, the the preservation and perseverance of a polarized, a, a patriarchal home where there's a man leading and a woman following and the kids under their headship there. Um, I think the... I'm just I'm basically just critiquing the boomer generation again that that the that the patriarch leaving the home to go do like a job doesn't solve any of what you just described it, it actually just ends up making the the mother the patriarch in the home yeah because often these guys are returning from work coming with work inside of the house it's like you know not everybody can work from home and that's fine not everybody should work from home but the problem is is they're they're bringing it back and pretending that they're special with their problems that they're dealing with with their employer or whatever and they're coming back and it's like okay leave the work hat outside and come in and now it's time to switch on this other part of your soul this other part of your being which is the most essential and that is the leadership of your household i don't know i'm going to start advocating that men should work from home i was i was uh getting further into um uh, an anti-feminist book by uh, a woman named Marie Ann Robinson. And she talks about how after the industrial revolution happened and men left the home, like everybody worked at home, men and women both worked at home. Men may have been like 200 yards out that way in the backyard, but they were all at home now. Um, I don't know there's something I think that unfortunately it took a global pandemic to make it happen, but I I've done both. Are... I prefer yeah, working you... at home. I don't both. Yeah. Me too. Yep. Hands down. Hands down. Me too. Who, who yeah. does it? Yeah, it's so much better. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. Again, it's probably just the, this boomer representation that like you have to go out. And it's like, no, you don't. You can be away, like like sequestered. Like, Will, you're in an office. Tim, you're in an office. Like, Mike, you're in your basement. Like, having an office to get work done, that makes sense. But it's a it's a somewhat recent thing that like men left the home for between eight and 16 hours a day to go provide for them their families even even when i worked in schools if it was a boarding school so the property i lived in was pretty close to the classroom if a meeting wasn't compulsory i didn't have to be there contractually i'd just get on my bike and go home for a bit take yeah. my kids for a walk or hang out I'd minimize the amount of time at work as far as possible. Just yeah, dip in you and liked out. your wife and kids. <laughs> right. And you get to see your kids grow up more. So you can also have more influence over your family. And that's all leadership really is when you get down to it is influence, right? You need to influence them in the direction that you know is good for them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, and then this influence is complementarian. At the end of the day, we have to come back to the principle of complementarity. What the feminists hated, unfortunately, it it's also been prevailed upon by the red pill. It, it's, I think Nick, uh, no, no, Will, you're always saying um, red pill is just male feminism. Mike, Mike, you said this in your your interview uh, with Matt Frad. It's because both parties have, I'm not saying they're equally bad, feminism's worse, but both parties have alighted on the view of let's attack complementarity. Feminists do it because they say we'll never be truly equal under the view of Christian complementarity, which is correct. Uh, the red pill says let's attack complementarity because it, it conduces to a view that men and women, uh, that a husband and a wife specifically are equal. Um, they're actually wrong. The feminists are actually right. Um, co complementarity rightly conceived means that men and women will always be acknowledged as of, of unequal rank. A husband is higher. So the feminists are actually right, and that's in their opposition of complementarity. 
red pill guys are just sort of, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a Jewish Muslim movement, a, a weird combo of traits from um, Judaism and Islam, the red pill thing. And, and so our, its main practitioners, um, they get it wrong. They actually don't understand complementarianism even as well as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the, the witches from the Seneca Falls convention did that it is, um, a higher part like Adam needs a lower part like Eve. He doesn't need another dude if he's self-sufficient. That's complementarity. Right. Christianity's hierarchy. Heaven's all about hierarchy, but in hell, everyone's equal. <laughs> yeah. Why do you guys yep. think that there's such a, um, a shame like, why do you think men are ashamed of this proposition that, like, not only are they designed to be, but it's good for them to be in a deep friendship with one woman? They've been psyoped to believe the opposite. Yeah. A lot of it's the psyop, the popularization of feminism, but feminism psyoping men to feel gaslit or, 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 quote unquote, guilty about exercising their authority was like shooting fish in a barrel. It was the, it's the easiest psyop ever because like I said, the, the, the marital relationship between husband and wife, like I said earlier, is the most frangible. It's the highest, it's the best human relationship and it's the most frangible. It's the most nuanced. It's the hardest to pull off a peer who sometimes isn't your peer. I'm sorry. A non-peer who sometimes um, appears to be a peer. And and when it's good, it it feels so almost like a drug, you know, and to be in a happy marriage is the happiest feeling. And um, when things are just normal and happy and you're, you're joking and you're not going around issuing orders, um, you, you might say, you know, at the beginning of the day, I want everyone to do this, this, and this quietly. And then the rest of the day, your wife and kids go do it. And so then you just a achieve a ostensibly kind of peer like re re rapport with your wife and even with your older kids, because they're just doing what they're supposed to do. So you're goofing off with them. Kind of like a, a teacher that has really good managerial control over a classroom can be really, really friendly, friend like that is easy to, in, in times of stress, times of tension, be thrown out of kilter. And it's it's already the highest thing, the, the, you know, the, the most frangible relationship. So once they started leaning on it in the middle 1800s, and they're like, let's really popularize um, the view that this is evil. It was just so easy. Middle half of the 1800s, Tim. The middle half, sorry, sorry. Was it the first half or the third half of the 1800s it was that second key crucial middle half <laughs> inside you know what's yeah. funny is that i think a lot of people when they picture our households or anybody that espouses what we do um they imagine us on this like judge's chair with like this hammer and this like cloak on when really like if you actually took a glimpse into our homes i'm rolling around on the floor with my children playing with them and like cuddling my wife and like loving on them and it's like it, it's the the language portrays one thing and it in action is actually a lot of times the complete opposite and very rarely like if you're a real leader you're home very rarely are you making these orders yeah you yeah do it when yeah, you yeah. need to but you're not i'm not going around ordering my wife and correcting her and it, it, there is nothing like that it's the exact opposite it's like nothing but love and i'll even take it further too when things aren't when me and my wife are on different pages or we're, there's been an argument or something like that there's something in me that is com feels completely off yeah whether it's like it's emotional or it's spiritual i don't feel right and i still do my duties of course but i don't feel right until i get right with my wife there's just something and i've especially experienced this being on both sides one on just the civilly married side and then on the sacramental side after we got our marriage convalidated there was a there's a discernible shift when things are really good and homogenous in the home and when things are rocky. But yeah, it's just a it's just a funny thing. I wish we could get a glimpse. We could give the viewers and the listeners and especially our dissenters a, a glimpse into our homes. It would it would blow their minds. 
I know Tim, like I haven't been to your house, but I know I could picture exactly how you are because we've had conversations with your family around and yeah, it's complete, complete opposite of how we're viewed. It's funny. Now, Tim does actually have a big chair, a cloak and a gavel. He just, <laughs> that's when he makes, anybody, be that's when he makes patriarchal <laughs> statements, ex cathedra. Yeah. Yeah. I'm only infallible when I make them from the chair though. <laughs> <laughs> When I'm speaking, just like when I'm on like a plane press or I'm speaking to the Irish press and I just say um, crazy things, I, I have a bunch of um, um, patriarchy splainers that follow me around and they're like, no, what, what, what he said is really, really good. It's just a Pope Francis joke. No, it's true. Like a, a good boss isn't going around kicking the dog and issuing orders all the time. You're like, look, here's the main focus of this week or this month. Here's how I want it implemented. You, you might say it once all month. And then good a good wife and, and good non-brat children. This is another thing we need to do a show on is having these guys that have brat children. It, it's, it's from a failure of patriarchy. I've been seeing so many bratty children lately and dealing uh, just with the prospect of it. I So good wives and good children go do the orders. And so you're just not focused much at all on the orders or the hierarchy. It only becomes prominent when you have to look at it. The rest of the time, you really can relate to each other in a fun, lighthearted way. It's really, really straightforward. And it's just, it's only difficult to the extent that people, when they hear friendship, like the, the wasp boomer that says to his son, I'm not your friend, they're just automatically thinking friendship of equals rather than there's this whole other, even arguably more virtuous form of friendship between unequals, one of which has been raised to the dignity of a sacrament. That's, that's one of the problems. And that's why I, I want to put this out there for people, but I, I do want it to be clear also, maybe we should do a whole show on it at some point that the fourth commandment does crystallize the notion that, okay, once a husband gives an order, the wife has to do it. And you can't say, well, yeah, she has to, but it's just a venial sin. Um, a law that lacks an enforcement clause can't justify itself, doesn't justify its own existence. Every law needs an enforcement clause. And the enforcement clause, which I've been wondering at the paucity of female response to, proper female response to over the last five years, the enforcement clause is that's mortal sin. So, if a, a woman, if a man does give a hard order, and maybe maybe a woman's dumb and she married a, a, a sort of tyrannical man that's going to give a bunch of hard orders. Maybe he's not even tyrannical. Maybe he's just a micromanager. Most women wouldn't like that. I wouldn't like having a boss that's breathing down my neck all the time. But if you're dumb enough to marry him, then you have to do every order he gives. Women nowadays just need to find a strong man that that's inclines toward fewer orders. But the point is, it is at that point deadly serious. It is kind of like um, being issued direct orders from God because you're going to be judged mortally for disobeying. So it's a, a, a mediated relationship between the woman and God in terms of the rank structure. And that's that's what a man is. Well, man is the glory of God, woman is the glory of man. Yeah. And at the root of all of this, I think just realizing this, listening to you is a misapprehension about authority itself the fact that authority is good and human beings need it mm. so it's to the benefit of the wife that the husband has this authority really feminism is an expression of liberalism in that no one has authority over me that would be tyranny any kind of authority is tyranny i want to do whatever i want whenever i want and it's a paradigm shift isn't it that actually you do best when you are under the authority of the loving husband. It's one of the reasons that Aquinas says divorce is bad because it would leave the wife without the direction of the husband and her life will be worse as a result. Well, I think that's sort of what, um, I mean, Luciferianism, but also Protestantism and then feminism, the idea of empowerment, like the reason why authority should be comforting at least for a man is because we recognize that on our own will fail gravely so it's good that we have authority it's good that we have to be in submission to god himself because gosh on my own i'm going to screw this thing up and this thing this project is really really important 
But if you quote unquote empower people, um, men and women, but especially women with feminism, then they view that's that's when you can view authority as tyranny. Mm. Um, because mm. then, because it's, a, it's like you said, it's a misapprehension of, of, of what authority is and that it's good, but it's also, that's predicated on a misapprehension of what you are and what you are ain't all that cool. Like you're, you need a lot of help. Like women, you need all the help you can get. You should get as much help as possible from a man who is as getting as much help as he possibly can get from God. <laughs> yep. And it goes up the chain. So just like when a wife undermines a husband's authority she actually undermines all authority in the family including her own so one of the mm. dumbest things you can do as a wife is to undermine your husband in front of the kids like why should they take you seriously either you just taught them that lesson congrats but that also if you go up one level with the protestants rejecting the papacy like the institutional patriarchal structure of christianity Okay, right. You're undermining your authority as the man in the household too because you've split from that umbrella that you were supposed to be safe within. You've seen that diagram, I'm sure, of the different umbrellas with Christ overarching everything, then husband, then wife. Well, what that really means is like Christ's church, the patriarchy as embodied in the Catholic church. You reject that, then you're really rejecting him. And this is why I've forgotten which pope it was. Pius XII, maybe, um, described Protestantism as the great revolt against God. That's where it really starts. That's where the rejection of authority is. And it filters down into the chaos between spouses and between children and parents. Will, you, your verbiage there is eerily similar to the parable of the madman by Nietzsche. Um, when he says, who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon. What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually backward, sideward, forward in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Like this is what happens. You don't get to choose. Like it's, it's all in a causal link here. And if you just take one out, there's your, your unmoored. That's it. Did anybody have any final thoughts? I know, I know a couple uh people have have um um hard outs. I, I think I think we've exposited this really well. I, I would at some later point like to do a more in-depth dive on specifically um justification for the the idea that yes, women have to obey their husbands and it's a mortal sin not to but but for now let that be the the sort of guiding supposition that, that that's what it is and then maybe we'll justify it later but that's the sort of southerly boundary on this frangible but most special relationship christian relationship between husband and wife on, on a good day the high end it it does feel like a pure best friendship or maybe the the you know the just more productive days, not even worse days, but the days where things really have to get done. The husband has to give orders. We're reminded what it really is—a friendship between unequals. But it's a best friendship between unequals. People out there treat it really specially. And also, I think today's show. This is my final thought. Just demonstrates how when you are engaging in the highest sort of thing highest human relationship it's worth a lot of effort so i mean I, I once you've been married 20 years you shouldn't be having like a difficult talk every day or something like that that's not what marriage is like but it's it's worth struggling to keep lines of communication open and and trying really hard because it's a more nuanced relationship and it requires more effort don't think that this naturally higher maintenance relationship that's naturally more virtuous and confers more benefits um is inefficient if you have to put a little, little more effort into it than you do with your bosom chums or, or or people you work with and that's the kind of stupid incommensurability being applied by men when they're like oh my wife is you know maybe you have a good wife and maybe she's sort of 
um, wanting to put in more effort and maybe we should have a talk, not, not nagging you. I, I see some guys with actually good wives and they just, if they're not acknowledging the high frangibility, the highly nuanced nature of the relationship, maybe they're the ones avoiding the talks, which could actually bring them much closer together. So I, I think that's, that's maybe the, the meditation people could take for this week. Um, it's worth a lot of effort if you have a good wife. Mm. Even secular psychiatrists recommend 90 minutes of talk time per week between husband and wife. 90 minutes is a starting point. That's so low. <laughs> That's crazy. Right. And most people probably don't even need that. Yeah, right. Mm. Exactly. I mean, that that's what I, I'm adding that into my Rolodex of uh, arguments for men working from home, figuring out a way to work. Yeah somewhere close to home 90 minutes a week that only happens if you're asleep for eight hours and away from the house working for eight to 14 hours a day mm -hmm. right that's wild yeah yeah i think tim when we circle back the next part of this episode is talking about the uh um the submission piece i think we can't hammer that that one home enough so this is a yeah. great talk, boys. And by hammer, he Love doesn't you mean physical abuse. It, 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 thank, thank you, thank you, Nick Stumphauser. I appreciate it. Are you threatening me, Michael? <laughs> Luckily, he didn't yeah, get his he didn't get him. his heavy hands out today. He kept them on the table. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, he laid the hands, heavy the hands to his hammer. The crown. <laughs> All right, guys. God bless. See you next time. God bless. God bless you, dude. God bless everybody. See you later.